Hi, welcome to the video. Thank you for being here. I appreciate having you here. We are going to be talking about Dendrobium suticnoid today, and there is a lot to talk about. Not just its care, we'll get into that, but also the mistakes I've made with this orchid in the past, where I almost lost her, how I went about and corrected those mistakes, so that within the next year, the new growth is blooming. And if you're not into my setup, I'm going to suggest an organic alternative as well, so that it doesn't mean that you have to grow the way I grow and you can adapt the care of your sutic noi according to your preferences. So I'm just going to point out that originally this species is found on the island of New Guinea as well as the Maluku Islands, but specifically the Moratai Island of the Maluku Islands. Here it is in southern Spain where I'm at. Or is it because... The jury is out whether this is in actual fact a sutic noi because my orchid is small compared to the actual size a sutic noi can grow to, which is like one meter, three feet thereabouts, with long fluorescences with many, many blooms. Now we can also consider that maybe mine is still a baby. It has as yet to mature. It has as yet to show its potential. We can also consider that my climate is not ideal for a Dendrobium suticnoi, and for that reason, it's growing stunted. We can also take into consideration that I almost lost this orchid and for that reason it is stressed and has yet to grow to its full potential. There are a lot, a lot of variables as to why mine is small. But then we look at the blooms and we look at the Dendrobium suticnoi on the interwebs and they also differ to mine. And I have been looking into suticnoi for a while and then I lost interest because at the end of the day I am treating mine as if she were a suticnoi and this is a care and how is it growing video about Dendrobium suticnoi. She is doing well, she is performing despite what I've put her through, she is blooming. So, until I do not have a confirmation that this is not a true suticnoi, I am still going to be able to tell you how I care for this orchid. So I did just now briefly address the subject of setup, so let's just continue with that thought. And in doing so, let's talk about the mistakes I made, my analysis from those mistakes, and why I opted for lava rock and self-watering. There's a pot within a mask that has microfiber and the mask itself has a reservoir where I either have water in it, fertilized water, or I give the orchid a soak just like that. The reason I chose lava rock is because I grow in inorganic media. It is my preferred media of choice, be it Lekka ceramis, pumice, or lava rock. Mainly I grow in Lekka and self-watering. And that is what this orchid was subjected to for the first three years of its existence with me. And it was doing quite well because I could keep the lecker nice and warm. I was using heat mats. This orchid, being a warm to hot grower, does not like to have cold feet. What happened was my circumstances changed. The climate within the grow space where I have to overwinter this orchid changed. And lecker has an evaporative cooling effect, meaning that no matter what the ambient temperature is, Lekka itself is a little bit cooler than that, which is great for orchids that like to have cold feet, but not good for orchids that are warm to hot growers and don't like cold feet. That is where the decline started to happen. Dendrobiums being robust, I thought, well, never mind, it's going to be okay. It just needs to grow a new growth. And then when I repot it, I am going to be using small Lekka because this orchid likes to have a lot of water when it is in active growth and when it is blooming. So small Lekka would give me that water retention and that wicking efficacy to allow for all that water that it wants. It does not like to have the media dry out when it is growing actively. It does not even like its media to dry out for an extended period of time when it is not growing actively. So that just shows you how much water this orchid likes. Small lecker would have been ideal and then the thought occurred to me when I was repotting this orchid that if I'm going to save this orchid and not have a repeat decline year in year out because of the lecca and the evaporative cooling, I better opt for lava rock as my inorganic media of choice because lava rock, even though it doesn't have a wicking effect, 
it retains a lot of moisture in between all the nooks and crannies of the structure. And because of that structure, there is a self-watering effect per se. The media never dries out if you keep watering and if you keep flushing and if those microfibers stay damp. And lava rock doesn't have the negative side effect of evaporative cooling, meaning the roots of this orchid won't be too cold during the colder months of the year. So I opted for lava rock besides the fact if you're trying to rescue a dendrobium from any form of stress, put it in lava rock and it's going to be fine. Now, if you are not growing with inorganic media and you have organic media that is your preferred choice, then I would highly recommend putting this orchid into sphagnum moss only and depending on your climate and conditions or the other alternative would be medium size to seedling size bark. That gives you the same amount of water retention that this orchid needs when it is in active growth. And once again, I am talking from the perspective that I have a Sutignoi even if she isn't. This is exactly how I'm treating this orchid and it is all credit to this orchid that she is robust, that she can absolutely handle what I put her through because not only is she blooming on the first new growth after the stress because you can see all the nonsense that happened in the past she is also already growing a new growth so while all this is going on in the pot I am fertilizing constantly now the roots are a fine root structure so I'm fertilizing at 150 parts per million not for any other reason but to make sure that I don't lose the roots in the pot and 150 parts per million do that twice a week will go to 300 parts per million which is plenty for this growth to grow to size. Will I get one meter and then see if this is actually one of those big sutic noise that I'm supposed to have, that I bought? Or will this be the maximum size growth that I can achieve because of my climate and environment? That remains to be seen. But the fertilizer levels are very conservative because I want this orchid to recover and gain strength. And doing that twice a week because she is extremely thirsty is plenty. Plus I flush in between every single time the reservoir is almost dry and I have to refill with fertilizer. So she gets two flushes a week, keeping that pot nice and fresh. And then I fill the reservoir with fertilizer again. Back on the shelf she goes until next time. But let's address the subject of supplements. I am giving her this year a lot of calcium and magnesium simply because now she has roots in the pot and I won't be taxing them, stressing them with too much of a good thing. Dendrobiums can also thrive and survive without having all that fancy nutrition and supplements. They are versatile like that. They can take a lot from the canes that are reserves in the back. But now she gets a supplement once per month of calcium and magnesium. And being an active growth, she also gets a dose of seaweed in that same solution. So my calcium magnesium is at around 60 parts per million. My seaweed is around 40 parts per million. So the total is 100. And because I want the absorption to be 100 percent I put that in at a pH of 6.7 6.8 and within a couple of days that is gone as well after which the pot gets flushed again and I put back the fertilizer again and then back on the shelf she goes and I want to show you how closed my system is here the absorption of whatever is happening in the reservoir is not because of evaporation or the warm temperatures the orchid is that thirsty so I've addressed the shelf several times already in this video and her shelf space is where she gets the light requirements that she needs. She does not want any direct sun. Bright shade would be perfect and bright shade all year round. So in the summer she is on my east side but at the bottom lowest shelf when she's not in bloom because that's when I move her to my blooming alley but her place of residence is on the east side on the lowest shelf of that rack and behind a curtain while the sun is pounding down in that area and then once the sun has moved behind the building the curtain goes up and she's still in bright shade and the same for the winter. Now my circumstances have changed a little bit so I'm not using artificial lights and it's just a hold on tight get me through kind of light whatever 
I hold my breath and hope for the best. Since the last winter though, everything has gone well and she's still blooming. This spike started late spring, early summer. So that was a time period when it was extremely dark in the growth space. So you can see that she is in actual fact a happy bloomer despite not having the optimal amount of light levels for four months. And I was so much more comfortable having her in lava rock this winter because of the cold temperatures and honestly, during the winter I almost forgot about this orchid only to take her out occasionally just to flush the pot just to make sure there's some oxygen in there something fresh for the roots to draw from and just to make sure that I don't let that pot get too dry for too long and that to me is almost forgetting about an orchid because normally I have to flush more regularly during the winter other pots that are in Lekka and another thing about this beautiful orchid is the fact that I have never had a pest problem any issue issues this orchid had were all my doing. No pest has ever been interested in her. Thank goodness because dendrobiums are fussy when it comes to pest treatment products, insecticide and such. They will object and probably drop their leaves and actually eventually cause a complete demise of the orchid simply because we're doing pest treatments. This orchid has attracted none of that, making her a very, very easy to care for orchid. My temperature range is from 14 degrees Celsius, which is the lowest I have experienced in my growth space, up to 40 degrees plus, which here I have not had a lot of. So it's not a daily problem of having too much heat, but I do like to put out my maximums have been 40 degrees Celsius, just to give you a range of what this orchid has to deal with and can tolerate. Meanwhile, there in orchid paradise, New Guinea and the Malay Laku Islands. The humidity is always around 75 and higher. That is not anywhere near the humidity level that she gets here with me and yet she's still doing well. So you see when it comes to humidity plus water, this orchid is thirsty. Keep that in mind. If you don't have the humidity, you need to make sure that you can somehow accommodate the lack of humidity with your setup. I praise this orchid for her resistance because she's less fussy and less moany than I am when it comes to cold temperatures during the winter. So I have a lot to learn about being tolerant about cold temperatures. The resilience of this orchid should be my mentor. <laughs> And it is very unusual to get an orchid that is a species. Let's go back to the fact this may not be a Sutiknoi, but I'm treating her as such. The fact that these blooms are super long lasting. They do come abundantly if I hadn't lost two buds at the beginning. When I say super long lasting, it's been almost six weeks that she's in bloom. And the first bloom that opened is only now just showing signs of going over. The other ones will probably follow suit very, very quickly. But my goodness, what fun they are to have around. They are super interesting to look at. And also <laughs> trying to figure out what part goes to which bloom because everything is all over the place. I've mentioned the discrepancy in the possible labeling of this orchid. And then I also figured back in the day, maybe the light levels are higher where I am to what the Sutignoi has in its natural habitat. And for that reason, I have more intense colors, deeper, interesting lines in the lip and all the curling going on for the petals and sepals based on the fact I don't have as high humidity. Some of these factors could also influence whether this is a Sutiknoi or not. Either way, the blooms are fabulous. With all that intricate nonsense going on in the blooms, the blooms themselves are not fragrant. I guess she's sending plenty of signals to pollinators out there with her fantastic structure. If you were to look up something specific, if you're thinking you're going to help me actually ID this orchid properly and anything you may read out on the interwebs and look at blooms where you can find a match. If the orchid size says it's a giant warm to hot grower, large warm to hot grower, then this is not that orchid. That's a rabbit hole I have not reached the bottom of, but for the time being, it is really not a priority because at the end of the day, the orchid is now doing great. I just want to put it out there that if you're looking for a Sutiknoi and you think it is one of those, you know, compact growing dendrobiums, 
you buy yourself a Sutik Noi, know that I have put out the disclaimer that who knows if this is a Sutik Noi, why mine is growing stunted. We shall see with the new growth that is coming whether that is going to turn out to be double the size of the previous growth. Then I'm going to have to say, hold up, I did not have enough of a water supply in 2021 when the growth that is currently blooming was actually growing and I had to make a decision as to who needs it most. This year, I've got the water supply going and if this next growth is double the size, then I'm gonna have to wait another year to be able to give you a conclusion as to whether it had to do with sufficient water or if I just don't have a sutignoi. We shall wait and see. If you're interested, stick around. Updates will follow. <laughs> In the meantime, if I haven't covered every single subject that you had questions about or something you would like to know more of, please let me know in the comments. And thank you so much to Larry Jones and Sarah Rossi for your interest in knowing more about this orchid after having seen it in a Blooms For You video. And thank you to Trisha's Orchid Life for jumping onto the thread of those comments with an enthusiastic yay because here we are, <laughs> very encouraging and very much appreciated. Oh, and by the way, if you happen to know anybody else that might be growing a Sutik Noi, send this video to them and say, what orchid is this? Because we are not entirely sure, but it is being cared for as if it were a Sutik Noi. <laughs> that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so very much for watching. Have yourselves a beautiful day. On one condition though, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.